When I was a kid, my best friend was a boy. I was born in January, and he was born in April. And since our parents were close friends, we spent a lot of time together, even as babies. Over the years, we shared a ton of wonderful experiences and some scary adventures too. We explored the forests and built tree houses that we decorated meticulously with pine cones and grass and flowers. And then we'd have to have sleepovers because we'd be so tired after working on the creations. We would go through our parents' closets and put on their fancy clothes, and secretly take our bikes to the lake. Not the leggings, very Ted. Our friendship was the best and most natural thing I knew. But when we turned 12, something shifted. Other kids started to tease us, boys in particular. And even though I was a daring girl, independent and good at sports, I also loved to draw, did ballet, and wrote poetry. And those were not things that really reflected well on my friend. See. What was considered boyish and masculine, like playing soccer and doing woodwork, were still okay for me as a girl. But the more girly, feminine activities, like making pretty things to a treehouse, were perceived less suitable for my friend, a boy. And as the gender expectations expanded deeper into our lives, they chipped away the intimacy of our friendship. Other kids were not the only ones that teased us, though. In fact, adults started labeling us much, much earlier. They called us lovebirds and winked an eye and predicted we were going to get married. And I hated it because they didn't know what we shared. They didn't know we secretly cycled to the lake either. So, what did they know about our connection? I didn't understand why people wanted to belittle what we had as a love story. Because when I looked around, I saw couples break up or divorce. I saw couples fight and hurt each other in the name of romantic love, and that really didn't compare with the intimacy and goodwill that I experienced in my friendship. Well, certainly as a child, I didn't know much about seduction and passion, or recognize the lawful commitments of marriage. Or the responsibilities of paying a mortgage and raising a wild bunch of kids, but I did pick up on the assumption that a friendship between a man and a woman was a stepping stone to wedded life, a subsidiary to a romantic relationship, not something to be celebrated in its own right, but rather the fodder for gossip. And popular culture further perpetuates this idea that. Intimacy between a man and a woman has sexual tones. Movies like Friends with Benefits and No Strings Attached depict friends who battle to stay just friends, but end up as a couple anyway. And I think it says a lot about the gender expectations that we hold in our society: that whenever heterosexual men and women share a space, they cannot resist the magical chemistry that boils in their brains and veins heading south. Even the current vice president of the United States is known to only dine with women when his wife is present. And these examples seem to suggest that men and women are more gendered beings than human beings. And the relational stereotypes don't just show up in discourse and action. The heterosexual bias also appears in the structures of our society. This talk takes place in Finland, and here, if you're a student, the government grants you an allowance to support your housing and studying. The Nordic progressive welfare system aims to promote equality. Whether you're a man or a woman, rich or poor, you have equal opportunity for education. However, the government also has a policy, and according to the policy, if a male student and a female student share a flat. They're automatically considered to be a couple, and they should support each other financially. And since the government doesn't recognize friends of the opposite sex, such roommates are expected to support each other and are denied student allowance based on their gender. Well, all of this fascinated me, and I 
felt that intimacy, the psychological involvement, and its expression in friendships was much more available for me as a girl than what it seemed to be for boys and men. The gender expectations, particularly those that concern men, like coping on one's own and focusing on actions rather than words, they appear to limit the interpersonal options of some men. So I became a researcher of interpersonal communication, and in my role as a scholar, I've been investigating men's social relationships. Well, when you turn to research literature on close relationships, the first thing you notice is that it's predominantly on romantic relationships. Studies on friendships are in the minority. However, however here's what we know. Friendships are personal relationships between two people who share an emotional bond. What's typical for friends is that they have fun together, but they can also lean on each other for comfort. Dr. Will Rawlins from Ohio University has distinguished that friendships are voluntary. They're equal. There's no hierarchy, but rather mutual involvement. And this is true for both men and women. Still, the popular belief says that women have better and more meaningful friendships than men. So is this true? Research does affirm that women's friendships can be very expressive and entail a great deal of disclosure, self-disclosure in particular. And self-disclosure in female friendships means that you tell your friend what's going on in your life, how you feel about things, and you make yourself vulnerable by sharing the ugly truths about yourself, too. Studies on men's friendships tell us that men tend to be less self-disclosive than women. The argument is that men don't want to show vulnerability to other men because their relationships are marked by competition and raising. Some studies suggest that since men, men avoid sharing the intricacies of their lives, they focus more on activities and communicate companionship instead. The sense of loyalty, shared interests, and reciprocity in assistance, like offering to help in a renovation project, keep men's friendships thriving. Well, what happens when you put a man and a woman into a friendship? For one, women report feeling a greater release to have fun and express another side of themselves, active and playful, in their friendships with men. Men, on the other hand, say that they enjoy the freedom to have deep conversations with female friends and experience more intimacy in those friendships because they disclose more to women than to their male counterparts. There are two things to note here. One, if men report disclosing their cares and worries to female friends, then there's no biological explanation for why men wouldn't show vulnerability to other men. So now the finger points towards gender expectations again. What kind of communication is encouraged or discouraged from men and women? And it's an important question we need to ask ourselves since we socially construct and uphold the gender norms by talking about boys and girls, men and women, the way we do. Discourse matters. Two, there are many ways to communicate intimacy in a friendship. We're used to thinking about intimacy as the verbal expressions of affection and connection. But intimacy is highly contextual. And by that I mean intimacy depends on the friendship. Communication, the way friends talk to each other, how they recall past experiences and build trust, what kind of routines and rituals they have, how they show availability and grant each other autonomy. It all varies according to the individuals who create and maintain that friendship. Therefore, intimacy may be communicated by telling your friend how much he means to you over a pint of beer. Or it may be communicated by adding an inside joke under her Instagram post. Friendships are unique, as unique as we are as individuals. 
My research on Finnish men's friendships confirm that men too have close relationships with other men, and they do provide emotional support to each other. And the opposite is true too. Gender expectations make some men hold back and avoid self-disclosure in their same-sex friendships. Nevertheless, those men who experience the freedom to express themselves report having intimate conversations with their male friends and share their lives openly with their male friends. So we should really perceive men and women as trees of the same forest. They both value talk equally in their friendships, and they mark enjoyment of each other's company as one of the most important qualities of friendship. The truth is that as individuals, we're all different. And our individual differences outweigh the gender differences by a mile. In other words, men and women are much more similar than different. So focusing on the differences is like zooming in on zebras and claiming that the animals are either black or white. In the past decades, we've seen an increase in friendships between men and women. Adolescents and young adults, they spend time in mixed groups. They accept various gender categories into their social circle, and they're less constrained by the binary male-female dichotomy. Therefore, it's time for us to hit the refresh button on our beliefs about friends of the opposite sex. Intimacy is not a gender thing. It's not a cultural thing either. Intimacy is a human thing. We all need connection. So I propose we take the following action. First, look within yourself. What are the gendered ideals you have about friendship and why? Be mindful about the way you describe other people's friendships, because we can truly only know about our own. Let's respect people's unique attachments and celebrate all bonds that make us feel good. Second, support children in becoming friends and staying friends with kids that they have fun with and who share similar interests. Those kids may not always be your best pick, but remember, we cannot choose who other people feel connected to. And don't just advocate for children's friendships. When it comes to your romantic relationship, encourage them to hold on to their personal friendships. Because friends are like mirrors. We get to see ourselves through the eyes of those who accept us and care about us. And that's invaluable. And while you're at it, take a closer look at the zebra you possibly have at home. Because when I think about where I am in my life, I have a wonderful lover, but I admit, I love my friend more. <laughs> Luckily, they're the same person. Because <laughs> I don't love him because he's tall, strong, or handsome. I love him because he's there for me, and I can be there for him. And we share good laughs together, and we're free to walk away every day. And yet, we choose to experience life together. Because all great relationships require respect, the right to autonomy and privacy, expressions of gratitude, and continual show of trust and being worth your word. And these are all the fundamentals of friendship. Your biological sex does not determine the intimacy you can experience in your friendship. You and your friend determine that. You are the carpenters of kindness in your relationship. Even though my childhood friend and I spent less and less time together as we became teenagers, our friendship never left our hearts. After travels, marriages and children, we're still as connected as we were in the forest, decorating the tree house with pine cones. So if you want to build a solid, close relationship. Build it on a sturdy oak of friendship. <laughs>